you know, we were just depleting the funds of the company right. to get this done. Right, right. At the same time, you know, we already had some senior people on board. Ten years ago, you had the giants. You are now one of those giants in DIFC. People recognize what you do. You are a well-established name. We're always hard on ourselves. We're always harsh on ourselves to achieve, you know, perfectionism, to deliver up to that standard over and over and over. And that takes a toll. Welcome back to the Chef JKP podcast. And on the show today, we have the founder and chief sustainability officer of the one and only award-winning restaurant, Boca, Omar Shihab. Omar, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, James. First things first, can you tell me your first or favorite childhood food memory? Getting right into it. I love it. Um, this one actually starts at the... the salt marshes. I don't know if you can call them that. There is an area in Um Al Quwain right now um, on the coast. I think there is a lineup of hotels that exist in this specific location. And um, it used to be very shallow waters that would obviously recede with the tide and, and come in. And I, and I remember my dad took us there. It's, very, it's a little bit blurry of a memory. I might have been maybe seven years old. And he didn't really explain where we were going and what we were going to do. But we took with us uh, a large mesh bag. Right. And what we ended up doing is clam fishing. Oh, wow. Yes. We stayed the entire morning. We left at dawn. And I think... We must have spent a couple of hours just clam fishing. The water will be just below our knees and, and in the deepest uh, uh, points. And um, that's what we did. And then we took them back home. And, and mind you, my father, you know, his upbringing was not near the coast at all. So my father comes from the northern part of Jordan. And, and Jordan is mostly landlocked. So his understanding or, or um, experience with seafood is, is very limited. Uh, but obviously, living here in the UAE, moving here to the UAE in, I think it must have been 78 when he moved here, uh, he picked up a lot of this, obviously, here. And he was um, an, an avid visitor to the fish market. And he would spend a lot of time there. He would take us there. But I remember, so we, we took it back home and, and we just boiled it, boiled the hell out of it. Okay. I can't remember. I was going to say, wh wh what rice. did he do? It wasn't anything elaborate, but it was just that this act is so imprinted in my memory. And it was in uh, an, an old house that we lived in in Sharjah. And I don't rem I remember bits and pieces of the house, but this particular memory you know, sticks in, in my head. And then what were the types of, of foods growing up? Were you, were you based in Sharjah or, or Dubai as, a, as an adolescent? So I was born in Dubai, but I lived in Sharjah all of my life. And um, the foods were obviously the foods that we, that we cooked at home. You know, your typical home-cooked meal uh, in, a, in a Jordanian uh, or Levantine family. A lot of stews, obviously. Uh, a lot of vegetables in, in broth. Um, a lot of vegetables from beans to okras. On the weekend, though, my dad made it a point that we would go to the fish market on a Friday morning and cook some sort of some sort of fish. It was mostly baked, so we'd have two versions. We had a version with a with a rich, thick, spiced tomato sauce, and another one with a tahini and walnut sauce. Oh wow! Incredible. So good. And, and what were those experiences <laughs> like in, in the fish market back then? I mean, for me, it was not uh, entertaining at all, right? It was just like, okay, we're, we're, I guess we're going again. 
But I remember walking up and down the alley in the old fish market of Sharjah. Mm. Um, and, you know, it was, you know, once we were there, it was exciting in a bit where we see, you know, live fish just coming out of the boat because we would go early morning and then uh, queue up for them to be descaled and, and, and skinned. Um, and then next to it would be a, a small uh, vegetable and spice market. And there would be bags of black lime. I remember that very clearly. So, you know, th these these memories are really imprinted in, in my head. <laughs> I love black lime. It's one of the most so under good. underused ingredients, I think. It's amazing. So then when you went into your sort of formal education, what did you decide to study? So I went to school in Sharjah. And straight out of school, I was meant um, to go back to Jordan. Uh, and I got uh, into uh, a university actually uh, in, in the same big city where my dad comes from, um, from in, in Irbid. But during that transition, during that summer, uh, I received notice from the American University of Sharjah here uh, in the UAE that I received a full scholarship uh, oh, okay. because of my my grades, I guess, back in back in school. Um, and I went into business school. I studied information systems. That, that was my formal education. Uh, straight out of that, I joined an American company uh, that was in research and consultancy. And it was the first office. It was established. It was the, the office um, setup that I was responsible for and, and uh, research in a, in a particular program. We were economists. We were economists for the IT industry. So our customers would be the, the IBMs and the Dells and the Microsofts of the world. They would seek our advice for uh, understanding markets, uh, understanding segmentation within markets, uh, forecasting. So that's, that's, that's what I did. And it was a very exciting time of my life, uh, those first four or five years, because I was, uh, I was responsible for opening bases across the African continent. So I was satellite between Casablanca for north, Lagos in, in the west, uh, Nairobi and Johannesburg, and then Istanbul. And then we had, a head, we had headquarters in Prague in the Czech Republic. So I would spend certain years, you know, up to uh, 200, 250 days out of, out of the year in, uh, in, in hotels somewhere. And it was exciting because, you know, I was visiting a lot of these places for the first time. Um, we didn't do a lot of traveling when we were young. We would do the, you know, the, the annual summer pilgrimage yes. to Jordan. Um, we went to Syria, I remember, a couple of times. Uh, but that was it. Uh, so, so this was really, really exciting. And I, and I took it all. I absorbed it all. And I only have fond memories from all of these places. But that must have also helped you moving forward, the, the economy part, learning about different economies, different businesses. Because if we fast forward to 2011, when you were general manager of Foodworks, tell me about that specific role. What were you doing then? So fast forward, um, eight years later, I, I stayed in that company for, you know, for, for all of that time. And I decided to take a year off to go back to school, to study to explore what would be the next step. So one of the projects that I stumbled upon was um, a, a food operator that was already set up by my, my the extension of my family, so my in-laws set up a food operator. Um, they, they wanted to stay in that business and I offered to take the lead uh, on that. So uh, it was already established. It was already set up in DIFC. And they, had already, they were already running a franchise from Italy at that time uh, in, in the location in, in DIFC. So I started from the ground up, started understanding um, the process in the kitchen, in front of the house, um, going through auditing all our, our financials, uh, auditing the, you know, the, the human resource element, um, the processes, the SOPs, and trying to trying to fix whatever there were problems and enhance a lot of things that, that were there already. Uh, during that time, we also worked on a couple of concepts 
um, a couple of projects in Abu Dhabi in Doha as well. So creating uh, a new brand identity for uh, for restaurants and cafes. Up until the end of the agreement with that franchise that that was there in uh, 2011, the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, the family wanted to stay in the business and uh, they were happy to continue to invest. And that's when I stepped in and and thought and, and and was doing a bit of research and had what would formulate what Boca is uh, at that time. So I kind of understood or had an idea on what could work uh, given the budget that we had, given the location, the neighborhood, uh, competition, of course. Those are the origin stories of Boca. So if we then go to 2012, when you were having those initial conversations about the concept, did you already have the name? And, and, and also I want to sort of understand, did you already have a, a sort of thought process about the food? Because if we look at the IFC now, it's no way near what it was 10, 12 years ago, right? So, so how was that whole thing born? So very simply, um, we created the the feeling that we wanted to have in that concept. I didn't come up with the name. We came up with the format. So we thought, you know, at that time, uh, the neighborhood had Zuma, uh, LPM. Uh, it was still Lepiti Mizo at the time, Roberto's, and Gaucho was, sti- was being constructed. That was it. That was it. Those were the only restaurants uh, at the time. So given this competition, uh, we thought uh, we wanted something that is slightly more uh, casual, if you like. Um, not necessarily at the height of fine dining, but at the same time, you know, we could, you can't compromise on quality of food or service because we would be serving the same people. The target were the lawyers, the bankers, the heads of the financial institutions, everyone working and living within DIFC. So we'd be a complement to that existing offering, a kitchen that is open all day, something that is um, easily approachable, whether it's lunch or after work or, or dinner. And we thought in a cuisine that was underrepresented was Spanish, modern Spanish, that was underrepresented in the city in general, even maybe in the country, with a modern execution, mind you, because, you know, Dubai is a, is a modern city, is a new city, so we never wanted anything in the restaurant from the aesthetics, from, from the build to the, to the menus to be anything that is heavy or too traditional, so it had to be modern. And we thought, you know, a lot of the modern tapas restaurants in in the big cities in Spain, like Madrid and Barcelona, you know, they they have that uh, ability to attract, you know, a business crowd, especially the ones that exist in in the central districts, the central business districts. They're able to attract a business crowd, but at the same time, you know, have that snowball effect of a little tourist coming in or, or, or people from the rest of the city. So that's really the the what we wanted to have. So a feeling that was unique, that was modern, uh, that was uh, appreciative of obviously gastronomy and, and, and food, but not necessarily stiff, no tablecloth, so none of that. Um, slightly more European style of service. Those were the initial, um, if you want, that that deck that we put together and presented to a branding agency that came up with the name we had we had had a list of names so we worked with a local agency called north 55 brilliant brilliant guys um they really got us they understood what we wanted to to create and we definitely wanted a short name we wanted a one word name uh that made uh sense in perhaps latin uh languages uh something that was uh easy to remember so Baca was definitely uh, 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 the one that caught us, caught our eyes, and and and, and made absolute sense. But but during during that time, the you you already had you already GM you already were consulting, so so you knew and uh, you had an idea of what you were getting yourself into. But what were the biggest challenges, sort of pre-opening phase for you? 
it was a very long pre-opening. So in theory, we had all the elements on board. You know, we had what we believed, and we still believe that is the right concept to put in. Imagine at that time when we only had four other concepts next to us. So we believed that we wanted to complement. We never wanted to offer something that is a similar experience, even if it's a different cuisine. Um, that would what that was what we would what would um, uh, uh, differentiate us, right? So we, we totally believed in that concept. We totally believed in everything that we put together from a project management perspective, from you know putting timelines, getting the right people on board, and it was um, you know quite a quite a, a, a deep dive of, a, of an exercise when you know went in to meet a lot of the branding agencies before um, finally settling on one. Uh, it was it was it was the the feeling that I got from these guys whether they understood whether they were able to translate what I had in my head or not because I am not you know a, a branding person I'm not an interior designer I'm not a chef but you know I have this concept in mind and it's really up to that person and up to me selecting that person or, or these 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 people who would visualize it for me in a brand mm. in interiors in obviously a menu so in theory this is what we walked in with but reality is obviously very different so one big uh setback that really i think stopped stopped us from from doing any work for close to a year was the initial concept that we presented to the, the authority, um, to our landlord, and, and it was approved. But then there were some minor details that um, were not approved, but that came in a little bit later. But it came in a little bit later, you know, um, w very specific to one area in the restaurant, mainly the outdoor area. And at the time, we had already assigned the contractor. We had already put... Um, Plans the, the in place. contract for for bidding and right. and we selected the contractor and they started mobilizing, and then all of a sudden we had to stop and redesign. So going back to the interior designer, it's not oh. just resketching one part, canceling one part. You have to revisit the entire space. Um, certain business models were based on that, based on number of seats, based on uh, capacity, based on how long we could we could use. The space uh, throughout the year so that really set us back um, another another one was I was adamant at being involved in every step of the way so we didn't assign a project manager I, I was doing that 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 part from, how, from how, how was it for you let's just say it uh, it, it aged me <laughs> yeah um, and and I'm talking about the only the physical part. I mean, obviously, I was already responsible for all the other elements from, you know, hiring the right people, putting in, you know, all the initial uh, uh, framework mm. for what the restaurant was going to be like, you know, from service, menu, etc. But that part really, really set me back. Like, personally, it was a lot of soul searching. Um, and and for, for one simple reason, it wasn't just the, the work. I was, I was doing the work. But I think it required a different kind of person that was just dedicated for that. Um, it's also something that, you know, sometimes when you have, you know, certain contractors or uh, certain people working with you, when they see you as someone who's responsible, as owning the entire project, going into the smaller, finer details and owning these as well, then they get, they're going to have a little bit of a hands-off approach and say, you know what, you know, he's taking the lead. Okay, go for it. There's a Dubai, Dubai municipality approval. There are five of them that you need to get done. Here are the here are the drawings. Get it done. Civil defense, you name it. And did you have any experience beforehand doing any of this? No. Uh, it you know, followed common sense. Uh, these are the drawings. These are the requirements. Uh, let's go. But it's not always that straightforward. Yeah. But you must have learned, I mean, a <laughs> huge amount 
fast tracked into so many things. Incredible. But yeah, Incredible. that must have been um, quite taxing on your self, you know, uh, physically and mentally, because that's not an easy task. As you quite rightly said, you already have the responsibility of setting up the entire team, mobilizing so on and so forth. On top of that, you're also responsible to project manage this, but you haven't really had any previous pre-opening experience so that must have been super challenging oh no it was it was um there were really a lot of soul searching there were almost dark days yeah. and, and mind you these are times when we were um you know we were just depleting the funds of the company right. to get this done right right at the same time you know we already had some senior people on board senior managers oh. a chef on board right 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 um it was it was transitional, so we were lucky that we kept the kitchen intact up up until the very last days. So the kitchen work was mostly expanding the space that we had, redesigning, using a lot of the existing equipment. That, that was that was also the the big challenge is how do we make use of a lot of the stuff that was inherited from the previous concept. So really, the exercise was. On many levels, we had to think of everything. It wasn't just stripping the whole space down. It was obviously in in uh, in front of the house, because one and and I'm so glad that we get this we got this done. The space that we received was meant to be a gallery, and it was fitted out in the previous concept with that, with, with, with without changing that. Oh my god! What that meant was, uh, first of all, physically it was on three levels. Imagine, you know, running a fully fledged restaurant, the service on three levels. It was it was terrible for, for service. Uh, and then the other part was all the MEP work that was uh, set in place. It would be enough to run a gallery and the gallery needs a few spotlights, maybe a laptop. Uh, we would plug in a coffee machine and we would be maxed out. So the whole the upgrade that we had to do to that space was huge. It took it, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Take me to the first week of opening once all of that had been fixed team in place everything is ready everything tell me about your first week of opening we did something that i you know i look back at and i thought you know maybe that was a that was a good thing i'm, I'm not sure um a lot of restaurants are, are doing it today uh we opened with the hoarding still up so because you know we commissioned the kitchen um, we did a, f a few first rounds of testing because it was prolonged as well. You know, at some point, you know, we, we did multiple testings and, and at some point we said, okay, now we just got to open. Uh, we start receiving people and it felt very intimate because obviously friends and family, mm. you know, all of our neighbors walking behind the hoardings and dining in the space. Um, still, MEP was not up to scratch. So there were certain days when you know, the, the entire room was filled with smoke because, you know, the fan on the oh roof was still up to scratch. <laughs> but we still pulled through. We still pulled yeah, through. Yeah, of course. I think, I, I don't think anyone had, the expectations from people were very varied and people didn't know what to expect. People thought maybe, oh, it's a homegrown brand. So, and it's people coming in without necessarily a lot of background or experience. So they, they didn't know what to expect. And when they saw, obviously, the quality of food, the creativity, you know, that fresh um, take on, on Spanish cuisine and how approachable it was, I think it, people, fit, people understood it. People got it. And there's one particular memory that is so ingrained in my head. You know, in that initial presentation, in that deck that I put together, before we even had a name, was the kind of feeling that I wanted people to have when they sat there in Boca. And one of the things that I wrote, um, and I was telling, I was, I was telling people, whoever I met, you know, when I was giving that brief, whether it was you know, interior designer or you know our uniform designer, was a story of of two people, you know, two men, you know. Uh, Two people have walked out of the office. Uh, they missed lunch. They're working in, a, in an office in DIFC. They missed lunch. It's four o'clock. They're, they're suited. 
you know, gray and blue suits and walk in the restaurant and just sit down um, and order a few, you know, a few bites, you know, a few drinks and then loosen up their tie. And that would be the rest of the afternoon. And that would then snowball into, you know, a little bit more after work crowd and then dinner service. And that's exactly what happened on the terrace week one. And, and this is the moment when I thought, okay, I am so proud of everyone that we assembled to run this project because without all of this coming together from, from the name to the brand, mm. to the interiors, to the chairs, to the service, to the menu, to the uniforms, that is what we're designing to get that experience. But at the same time, Omar, it's not easy to also be in a location where you have giants like Zuma, LPM. So to do that and also be operating immediately at that level is not easy. So you must have, uh, you know, well done, of course, for having that incredible vision, but at the same time for, for formulating an incredible team that can run that alongside you and also believe in the vision, right? Because that's not easy. But then when it comes to the food side of things, mm -hmm. How was it to, number one, to get the chef, number two, to ensure that that chef had your vision to put those things on the plate? You're right. This is the part where I was involved with, uh, and this is the part that maybe excited me, obviously, uh, the most. The, the project management side was definitely not, not the one. Uh, and again, it was, it was about going through that brief, spending a bit of time, um, with that person, whether it was, you know, a chef or a uh, restaurant manager, mm. uh, I really made it a point to spend time with them. I wanted to have a mix of people who were, who had background, you know, living and working in, in Dubai and the UAE and some fresh faces, fresh talent coming in from abroad, uh, from Spain. So we were, you know, I, I, I've been extremely lucky with the people that I've worked with. Uh, over the past 10, 12 years, um, building and operating Boca. Initially, it was, uh, it was someone that was just about to leave the city, just about to leave Dubai. And um, my very good friends, uh, Nick and Scott at the time, they, they recommended him, saying, check him out. He's about to leave. Um, and I went and he was, he was working at the time uh, at, at the embassy, if you remember, in Grovna House. Uh, it was Maxime Levant. And um, exceptional, exceptional talent, uh, creativity, execution. You know, what usually gets me in any tasting is the, uh, obviously, the, the refined, um, you know, presentation, execution, and flavors, and taste, and blending. But that texture, that play on texture in, in the different elements, that really got me. Um, and obviously there's, there are a lot, there's a lot of talent in the city that come from the same background, but then again, to be able to understand the vision that we, that we had, uh, and translate it into the menu, mm. that was, that's really right. what, what took it. And, and that's really what, uh, what, what I believed in, in, in Chef Maxime and everyone else that, that came after. Because also there, there's so many sort of elements to to your food extremely technical sustainable but at the same time you recognize it you know so i think that's amazing that you've managed to, to put that throughout the years but what i'm interested in is the arrival for yourself of michelin and 50 best and go Melo. did you expect that in the beginning not at all um I think the first five years was all about us establishing that identity, that clear um, differentiating factor from the get-go. I mean, you said it, we're surrounded by giants with a fraction of their budgets, uh, know-how, experience, etc. You know, what do we bring to the table? Right. I always ask myself, what are we, how are we going to be different? Um, and, and initially, like I said, that was the concept. The concept was to put in something that was of a certain cuisine that was not represented, but a certain experience and delivery that was totally different. And people got that. People appreciated that a lot. Mm. Um, people would come to us 
two, three times a week. More than 50% of our guests are regulars. Um, when they would go to <clears throat> our neighbors to entertain guests, you know, once every, every two weeks. And that's exactly the sweet spot that we nice. wanted to stay in. Right. But we never thought, you know, we, we, we always imagined that uh, the Michelin Gomeo 50 best, and it is obviously the game of, you know, the elite, the people who are executing food and delivery on a, on a very high, high scale. We never thought that there would be room or space for us. But as we progressed, and I think with our, with our story, and again, the value that we wanted to bring out of Boca, not, not just delivering an exceptional dining experience on the level in the format that we, that we have, but other stuff, you know, kind of digging deep into what it really means to run a kitchen and a restaurant in Dubai, in the UAE. What does that mean? What is the connection to the place that we have? And those are the origin stories of what would become today our sustainability framework and, and, and what people you know, know us for. Yeah, I'm going to get to the sustainability <laughs> part, of course. But I wanted to ask you also, just as, a, of course, so involved with, with Boca and, and seeing it grow. How was it when, when the name was announced about the star on, on, the, on the day of Michelin? How was that for you? So it was, it was obviously there was a, it was a build up um, because you, you get a, a little bit of a, of a heads up. Um, you're invited to that ceremony without knowing what's going to happen. At that stage, I think we've crossed a certain you know, threshold of really trying to put together to the best of our knowledge what would form sustainable dining and a sustainable restaurant in the city. By that stage, I had invested so much time and effort um, and, um, and, and taken time off and time out of the restaurant to understand to a deeper level our landscape, what grows here, what can we do in the kitchen, what do we want to represent, how do we how do we evolve what we have today without impacting that dining experience into what we believe is the most sustainable form uh, of, of, of running a profitable business? So by that stage, we have done the work and, and we believed in our work and we trusted in our work. What would come after was, was obviously great recognition. But at that stage, there's nothing you could, you know, whatever has been done has been done. And that's what's great about a lot of these top awards is that your work is, you, you know, you've been doing your work for years. Mm. It's not an application that you have to submit, or it's not a test that you have to write, or it's not, you know, that final presentation that you have to give and you have to impress a group of judges. They have come, they have seen, they have read, they've tasted, and they decided, and a group of them decided over a long period of time. And it was obviously an exceptional feeling. I wasn't sure whether I should accompany chef on stage because, you know, in Michelin, it's mostly about the chefs. Mm. But it was such a proud moment for me. And um, they allowed me on stage and you know, I said a few words. It was, it was a very important moment for me. And, and you know, the same feeling um, we have now with the recent 50 Best announcement. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, congratulations. Thank you. Um, because the the thing is, the reason why I'm saying before that 10 years ago, you had the giants. You are now one of those giants in the IFC. People recognize what you do. You are a well-established name uh, in the industry, not just within the country, but within the region. So, so but, but it takes a lot of hard work and dedication because let's not forget, uh, for those people who are not, who don't understand... Um, the Dubai sort of financial center, there are a lot of incredible restaurants that have come and gone. And the fact that you're still here speaks volumes to your team, to yourself, to understanding the client also. It's, it's really big. 
And that, that's, that's not a joke. You know, it's, it's a big deal. But then the other thing that I sort of wanted to sort of touch upon, which, which I think was a, a touch of genius, is that once your sort of prominent chef had left, there was a gap, obviously. But what you did, nobody else had done before. And that was to invite seven <laughs> of the best women or leaders in the industry to all come and have a pop-up. How, how did that idea come into your mind? I was so proud of that. And honestly, um, I enjoy the creative process where I let myself go and imagine what would be different, not for the sake of being different, but how can we really utilize what we have today, which is a not just a restaurant, but a platform. I always see ourselves as a as a platform to to bring to bring ideas, to talk about thoughts or concepts <clears throat> that I truly believe in, and I would love for them to have a lot more uh, a lot more spotlight. So, something that we we're very proud of, and we've been doing for a few years. Um, I think it might have started in 2017 even, when inviting others to share our kitchen, our space, whether it's from a, a, a producer of, of a certain ingredient or, <clears throat> uh, or, or a chef. That's something that we really enjoyed, really, really enjoyed. And, and we have, you know, th through our kitchens, we've invited some of the most talented people in the world and in the region. Mm. Constantly, we were, you know, a lot of names um, of international chefs, people from abroad, um, we've, who, who we've hosted in the past, we're very proud of. And at that particular time, you know, we wanted to run a program, uh, an event, uh, a series of events that would involve obviously getting new talent into, into the kitchen, doing takeovers. But I didn't want to approach anyone from abroad. Uh, and, and obviously, if you know me, you know I'm a, I'm a champion of local talent, local ingredients. Um, I truly believe that we have enough people living and working here that could come up with any concept that could rival any, any other concept from the world. And I think that's already established now with the list of restaurants and chefs that are yeah. operating in the yeah, city. Absolutely. So I started thinking of names of people who don't you don't usually see in uh, in kitchens in DIFC or within the circle within our circle and the list of names that started popping in my head started starting from Celia Stokin at the time she was uh, with Jumeirah still uh, I was in between chefs and I remember um, chef Ira from the Trade Center pointed her out to me because she was competing in something in, in Gulf food and said, you know, I'm not looking for chef and there's something maybe you want to take a look at. So I had her in mind and um, Gabriela Chamorro is a, is a good friend and uh, you know, very proud of what she's doing in our supper club, Sarah, Sarah Akel and Penelope and um, uh, who else was that? It was, uh, there were obviously all, all of these incredible mm. pop, pop names, Trisha. Um, all these names started popping in my head. Uh, obviously, Bethany Caddy, some, someone who we've done work in the past. All these incredible names that are not necessarily working in, uh, in, in a similar format as we are, or even in a commercial kitchen. And some have supper clubs, some are pastry chefs, some are working in, in uh, five-star hotels, some are working in independent restaurants. I thought, how cool would it be to put them together? And I had to actually stop myself at some point. It wasn't, it, it wasn't only these seven. There were you know, 10 more, but I thought, okay, let me start with that. They're all women. That wasn't the intention initially to create a women's series, but we found ourselves um, offering our space to, to seven women. And if you recall the title of the series, it had no mention of woman or female in it. I was very careful with that narrative. I, I, I hate greenwashing or just, you know, using any concept for the sake of using it to get any promotion or any, any of that. I genuinely 
pick them based on their talents. Yes, they were men. If you look at the photo, you will realize that they're all women. And even in, in, in the narrative, that, that's really all I wanted to do. Um, it was the season. We wanted an event to talk to. And, and I think we put together um, a good lineup. And, and from a media perspective, how was it picked up? Oh, it was incredible. <laughs> incredible. Because, you know, all of a sudden you saw um, a group of extremely uh, creative, talented, established uh, women taking over space in the IFC. And my brief to them was also to do them, to, to, to bring what they're doing to our kitchen. And you know, there's a lot of pressure on that. Yeah, of course. The pressure is always on the visiting chef, on, on the guest, because, you know, my team is ready. They're saying, okay, what do we do, chef? Fire up. Tell us what we have to do. How are we going to feed? I think it was uh, on average 40 guests per night over three nights. And it was a, it was a set menu or a la carte? It was, it was set menu. Set menu. Okay. Set menu. Um, what are we going to do? You know, new ingredients, new techniques, new execution. Uh, and, I, you know, she had to run a team of brigade, every single one. Uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't deliver on her own, for sure. So it's a, it's a lot of pressure. And yeah. I must say, I've been extremely impressed with everyone that walked through that kitchen. Uh, everyone had a different style, a different take, a different approach, different um, uh, 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 prep times. But, the sh you know, usually the, the guests never saw any of that. Um, it was incredible. Wow. I love that. Well, I think that's also such a an amazing challenge for your team. <laughs> for, because of back of house and front of house, they need to understand the chef. The, they need to understand the menu. They need to do the briefings with everybody. Not easy. You know, um, but and but at the same time, I understand that you're also doing that with a bar, right? Uh, and that's also something else that not many people are doing, yeah. which is also amazing. And, and because I also noticed that your drinks selection with the wines and the cocktails, they're really well paired. Mm -hmm. Also, what I love is the on the menu is the fact that you personally know the growers, the suppliers when it comes to the alcohol and the food. So that's a really big thing. But now, the one that everyone is asking me to ask you on here is the sustainability piece. Because you, you are one of the most sought-after sustainability champions in the country and the region. But the first question I'm asking you is, why do you feel or and why do you push so hard on that sustainability piece, not just within your restaurant, but within the region. Thanks, James. You're very kind. Um, I think it really started with that same uh, ethos and that same thinking style of how we created Boca. So again, and, and I said it earlier, I truly believe that we have enough creative people that we can come up with our own concept that could rival, you know, the giants. You're doing our own thing, of course. And initially, and, you know, the people who know me must have heard this story over and over. Although we were building uh, a modern European, you know, Spanish restaurant, it didn't mean that we couldn't use certain local ingredients. That's not usually what suppliers would tell you, especially back in you know 2012, mm. which you know, were yeah. <laughs> light years ahead, and you know for the right reasons because they're running businesses and you know a, you, a lot of chefs who who arrive in the city they're being told that that it's um, you know the quality is inferior and you want to take you know and and they can get you any product that you want from anywhere in the world exceptional produce. But we made it a point, and it, and it took more than just deciding that we're going to have this ingredient on the menu, because we had to go get it ourselves. None of this, none of the fish that we were using initially, and even until now, is available with any supplier. It had us go to market and select it ourselves. And we had one, one initial idea, one initial thought, which was, we don't want to have hamour on the menu because we understood that it's overfished. Okay, what do we go after? 
uh, we downloaded this sheet, um, uh, a fishing calendar that lists every species that lives in the Gulf and what are the better months to fish it. So we took that and we started experimenting with certain variety that you don't usually see. Uh, but what that took is establishing kind of a setup with, with, our, with our accounts, with our accounting team, is to say we're going to give cash in hand to our chefs to go to the market, select what they want to select, and come back with a scribbled note for a receipt. How, how did they take that? <laughs> no credit terms, no purchase order. No, no, that was like, you, you know, I want this setup. This is a dedicated amount per week. That's all we're going to take. And I promise you, it's going to it's gonna pay back. That's so cool, though. And that's what it takes a lot of the times. If you want to make a change in our business, it has to be systematic. You can't just come in and say, oh, today we're going to cook with this. The guys are going to do it once and they're going to forget about it. Yeah. If it's not ingrained in their daily task, in their daily SOP, in their daily checklist, it's not going to happen. It will, it will, you know, you might, you'll be lucky, you'll get it one, you know, once and, and then you won't happen. it won't happen again. But beyond that, I think, you know, throughout the years, understanding where we stand today on the global scale, the global dining scene, what are others in the world proud of? And more and more listening to the stories that were coming up from restaurants on the world's 50 best or, you know, Michelin or Gourmet all over the world, were people proud of the, the, the space that they exist in? And they are representing, truly representing the place mm. where they are. No matter, no matter how short or shallow that um, gastronomic or, or gastronomic culture, right? Take the Scandinavian example, right? Where it was elevated into what it is today from boiled potatoes and, and bland fish, mm. right? Um, and that is so inspiring. That was so inspiring uh, for me. And obviously, I have a deep connection to this land. You know, started with that story in these in these salt marshes where we were picking the clams, and obviously a lot more other stories like going to the desert after the rainy season and wild harvesting and picking certain desert plants. So, how do we build a, a truly homegrown restaurant, no matter what cuisine you are you are executing, that represents the land? And obviously, later on, knowing how we fit into the entire food system, us as restaurants, you know, the food system, the way that food is grown, harvested, transported and consumed, knowing our role and the role that we play in the overall uh, grand scheme of, you know, climate change and, and, and planet destruction and, and, and people destruction. Um, it was really like a, a bell that you can't unring. And that's the point when we decided to say, okay, this is what we're going to bring to the table. And we're going to dig deeper into something that we couldn't find a lot of information about, about you know, what it takes to build a, a sustainable restaurant or what it takes to run one, um, especially in the UAE. And that is perhaps what I took upon myself to try to imagine that, to research that, to understand to, to travel around the country, to, to know who's doing what. And at the end of the day, I mean, what other stories do we have apart from this? Yes, we can tell stories about the origin of certain tapas, and there is obviously tremendous heritage and history behind Spanish cuisine. And we are, you know, we are presenting that, and those are still ingrained in everything that we do. But we're operating this in Dubai. So what, is this, what does that mean? And there are obviously elements that go beyond simple, beyond sourcing, beyond ingredients uh, that have to do with running a physical space with food waste, which is, you know, transcends any cuisine or any restaurant. Uh, and, and I found myself getting, you know, deeper in that thought, deeper in, in that and uh, made a, a promise to myself or kind of a, a pledge that this is going to be my role and this is the value that I bring to the table and the purpose that guides me. But look, the other one, Omar, is the one thing that I find, I still can't get my head around it, to be honest. You know, there you can probably tell me better. I don't know how many restaurants there are in DIFC exactly, right? I'm probably imagining, I don't know, maybe 50. I don't, I'm not sure. Yep. 
from all of them, yours is running on 100% renewable energy. <laughs> yes. Right? So, and I'm just, I'm just like, how <laughs> on earth <laughs> did you manage to do that? Because this is no mean feat to do that. And, and, and I just think if you can do it, how can everybody else do it? But, but how did you do it in the first place? So uh, actually, that's the, the easy part. The, the, and and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you how we did that. The, the hard part was getting to that stage to say, oh, this is definitely what we're going to do next. Because this came from, again, the moment that we started putting this out to the world and talking about this and more and more taking up our narrative or actually just expanding our narrative, not really taking over anything else because we're still, we are still, we still truly believe and, and obviously we are first and foremost a hospitality concept, a restaurant, a food and beverage concept that is that promises to deliver exceptional cuisine within our style, within our format to our guests in a certain setting, in a certain service style. That is our promise. Now, whatever we're doing in the back, whatever we're doing in order to run up to our best, or to the best of our knowledge, a sustainable and a responsible operation, that is that is something that we took upon our shoulders voluntarily. And because we spent a lot of time understanding a lot of that and talking to people in, in the industry, whether it's food and beverage industry or for the lack of a better term, the sustainability industry, because there is one that is forming right now um, that has a lot of consultants, a lot of sustainability officers, a lot of people um, who have the technical knowledge within the energy space, within the food space, you know, within the policy space. So more and more, a lot of these people started uh, approaching us. And uh, we put ourselves up to the test. I really wanted to do things properly in, in, in whatever format, whatever framework that sustainability took. So first of all, I went into, uh, I, I started educating myself. So I took a, a course in sustainability to understand the right terminology, the right concepts, um, so that I can speak the same language and obviously apply a lot of these um, uh, concepts within within the restaurant, and that attracted me to a lot of that's a lot of the uh, people from that from these circles. We put ourselves to uh, a test, quite a quite a serious one called the Gulf Sustainability Awards, and this is quite a detailed submission that ministries, banks, uh, manufacturing companies, big. Um, waste management companies would submit all of their credentials to be judged by a panel and you have to present and argue your case. So quite a detailed submission. Um, I think uh, the, the initial Word document that was submitted was around 30 pages detailing everything that we're doing within the restaurant from an energy perspective, from sourcing, um, waste, etc., and then uh, an hour to present in front of uh, four judges from Whoa. not from hospitality. I don't know these people. I've never met these people. They're working in different industries, but I put up, we put ourselves up there, and we got it. We got the highest rating, and we were told that you guys are definitely on the right track. Uh, you've got the right framework in mind. This is an industry that needs big change. And what I realized later is that, yes, there are a lot of people within that spectrum, within the sustainability world that are talking about food and food systems, but there is a huge disconnect with us in hospitality and food and beverage and in restaurants. You know, us as restaurateurs, as chefs, as people running outlets, we are far removed from mm. that conversation. We only get the, what tickles down like bits and pieces. I really saw that up to, you know, the last um, uh, COP28 uh, conference that was happening. I was involved in a lot of discussions and I would be the only person in the room 
from our industry, from hospitality. And this shows to tell how you know, preoccupied we are with our busy uh, lives and what we have to do, because rightfully so, we are super busy, but we are part of that food system and we're so far removed. So, you know, going back to your question, that led us to meeting um, people uh, called Element 6. Um, they run a carbon management consultancy and they offered to audit our entire operation from a carbon uh, impact, which is the one of the important measures for you as, a, as any business. If you want to understand your impact, it's measured by carbon emissions. So they offered to audit our entire operation, uh, a long six-month exercise. Oh, my God. That had us submit every piece of data on the restaurant from down to the peppercorn by weight and by country of origin that we purchased in that particular year to our energy, gas, water, chilled water consumption to the commute that we that we do in the restaurant us as employees how do we come to work do we come by metro by bus by car what kind of car do we carpool do we walk to work what is the rough distance to a, to a very accurate degree it's very that detailed was right? very detailed absolutely um so we know now to a rough to a very accurate level um what would be your impact uh, as someone dining with us for that one hour, two hours in the restaurant being served by our team, um, cooking, you know, you, consuming that gas, sourcing that food, we know exactly what, what our impact is. And through these guys, they were able to offer us and tell us, by the way, you can move your entire operation to run 100% renewable energy. How? In a space like DIFC where I cannot install solar panels on the roof. Mm. Um, I, I definitely, if you ask me, don't have the, the budgets or resources to do that even, even if it was allowed. There's a very uh, simple way here in the UAE. So Dubai municipality, the Dubai government, the UAE government are investing heavily into renewables. Um, a massive project on a, world, on a worldwide scale is being developed in the desert. Uh, the Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Solar Park. And that is right now what I understand is feeding around maybe 10% of the electricity generated in Dubai or electricity needed to power Dubai. And that feeds into the grid and feeds down to me. So I can go, actively go to the park and tell them my consumption, my amount, my consumption per year in uh, electricity and they will offset it or in my case dedicate a solar panel that is right now exists in the in in the desert and it will feed enough power to to generate to to feed boca it will feed into the grid and feed into me and with that i receive an internationally recognized certificate that says yes boca runs 100 percent you're that's amazing energy. that's incredible no but, but also, why, why aren't more restaurants doing that? At the moment, I understand why. Uh, it's a bit of an offset. So I have to do it after I've paid my bills. But the idea is that as, we, as more people get interested in this, as the solar park expands and the network expands and the technology uh, enhances, the entire grid of Dubai is gonna be is gonna is gonna fe be fed more from from the park than right. what it is today. Okay. So eventually, we will reach that stage where the majority of the power is generated from the solar uh, park for those who cannot afford or physically install solar panels on their on the roof of their houses or restaurants. So then, weird question. Um, so if you're in the middle of service. And theoretically, something happens to that connection. You would still have the backup generator, so on and so forth, to run the operation, right? Oh, no, absolutely. So we're still feeding from uh, the grid of Dubai. And that is stable. Right. Okay. So the, the, electric, the, the, the solar park is, feeds into the grid and then feeds to us. So it goes into the entire grid. We, there's, no, there's no direct line, but, it, but that's where we're getting it from. Okay. The other thing that you've done is is you've actually within the menu of Boca, 
you actually have this two page sort of narrative which outlines everything that you're doing from the sustainability practices. Why did you feel it was important to showcase that? Like I said initially, everything that we're doing, we're doing in the back because we understand the importance. We voluntarily, actively pursued that. But it's a good story. It's a story that we wanted to tell others. First and foremost, to tell others what really what grows here, um, what do we have access to here. That is became what defines us, in a way. Communication is extremely important. What I came to learn from um, you know the, the world of sustainability, communication is key. And actually formulating it in a, in a story format is, is even more important because we're doing a lot of that work. And, you know, between night and day, you never know, you know, we might move the restaurant somewhere else or, you know, do something different. Mm. I was adamant at documenting everything, the entire process, because we believe that today it holds some sort of framework on how you can construct a sustainable restaurant. And we're all for sharing, you know, you know, publicly uh, available information. All this data is available on our website, the entire journey, the 30 page document that details everything that we've done in the restaurant from sourcing to waste to energy is all available for anyone to follow and see. So the communication part is very important. Obviously for some of our guests who care, who want to know, and we're finding a lot more people now wanting to know the origin of their food, the source, what are we doing in the back? You know, kitchens are are, are, are notoriously dark spaces. You know, we've always held back on opening our kitchens and telling people our recipes or, or um, having people, you know, see and understand how we operate, how we talk to each mm. other as, you know, uh, people working in a restaurant, whether it's front of house or back of house, doesn't matter. So for me, it was really critical. But how do we do it in a way that is um, easily understandable, uh, easy to read because, you know, people's span of attention is extremely short um, in whether it's a restaurant or online. So communication, I think, goes a long way. But it's an incredible tool for engagement for the guest. I mean, are the guests interested in this information? All of them, no. Some of them, yes. I think it really became um, what defines Boca today, and I and I would love to do it in a in in a better way to bring it more to life. Like you said, right now it's sitting in a static uh, page at the end of our menu. Um, there will be a day when that becomes a lot more integrated into our into our menu. I'm not sure digital format is the way to go because I'm a big fan of yeah. you know touch and feel. Um, but it's you know it, it's something that I that I think is really important. A lot of stuff are a lot of things are in my head. A lot of things are you know we're doing a lot of work. There's a lot of research, um, and I would love to tell these stories because also at the end of the day, and you mentioned it earlier, you know our. Um, relationships with the growers, with the producers. I mean, what other story do I have if it's not theirs? They're the ones who are tending to the grape or to that produce or fishing that particular um, you know, type of seafood or fish. And they're the ones who can tell us. And, and, and for me, I think that's what I would like to bridge, a, a deeper connection to the source of our food. But have you found that more industry people are coming to you and asking for advice sure absolutely and and um i am very happy obviously to share whether it's a, a source of a particular uh, item or a particular person is producing something and always happy to share uh, i think i've demonstrated that over and over whether it's my you know through with my industry colleagues or publicly what we put out there so i think generally Yes, the in industry people are, are, are very interested in, in what we do and we're happy to share and we're happy to, to put that forward. Uh, our guests, our diners are increasingly becoming interesting. Of course, we're constantly challenged by 
the the, the type of dining that uh, uh, people sometimes expect, and rightfully so. Uh, I mean, I don't blame anyone who's going out to have um, a little bit of escapism to un to to forget about reality for a bit. We all lead very busy lives, stressful lives. And we understand that our main role is to feed people um, not just good food, but give them an, an exceptional experience, have them forget about um, you know, their daily worries. And we understand the value and how much it's not cheap to dine out in the city. So we really value the dirhams that are being spent with us. We value the time that people take now to commute to come to our restaurant to maybe hire a nanny on the weekend, that couple, that only night out mm. to come and spend a few hours with us. So we're extremely grateful and aware of that. So if we can deliver to them that dining experience that they expect from us, and at the same time, run that responsible operation in the back and present it in a way that doesn't sort of disrupt that experience, because we will only do it if they are willing to listen and they have time and they're interested and we have nudges throughout the menu there are a few words keywords the illustration guide the map the carbon emissions report if you're curious and you ask questions you know our staff are generally ready with a 15 second pitch a 30 second pitch or maybe something a little bit more elaborate i receive a lot of connection requests from uh, our guests who are really curious and doing something within the space of sustainability. And I'm always willing to, you know, to talk, to understand, to, to explain. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where it is today. And I, and I truly believe it's very important. I'm trying constantly to improve things. So we're moving right now, our general illustration guide to be mapped and dotted across the, the UAE map to show maybe a sense of space. Uh, I love geography. I love maps. I love to see where things come. How far are we from the origin? What grows here? What happens there? Um, so, so I'm looking forward to to seeing that as well. The other thing I wanted to ask you is when it comes to human sustainability. Now, a lot of well, everybody knows hospitality is not the exactly the easiest industry, mentally and physically. Uh, a lot of taxing hours. A lot of sacrifices uh, need to be made in order to make sure that diners are fed and they have their experience for yourself you're not just an operator you're 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 an owner how do you think businesses can, can be better at the human sustainability factor yeah that's um it's definitely a tough one harder to measure we were able to measure everything in the restaurant you know the the, the top five ingredients that we source um, all the elements of waste that we produce, energy, all of that stuff, carbon emissions. But the human element, which is a critical part to a restaurant, is the one that is overlooked. Overlooked not just in a sustainability perspective, but an overall hosp hospitality perspective. And that's obviously been coming to light a lot more. And you're doing incredible work within that, within that space. But of course, it's something very, very important um, and it starts from the basics. I think we are lucky to live in a country where the majority of most of us, all of us, have to have a legal contract. Um, and, and in DIFC, it gets a little bit more elaborate from a, from a human resource perspective. So we have to have all these elements in place. There are rules and laws that protect uh, staff. I think generally... Us in hospitality, we are givers. We give all the time. It, the concept of receiving, I think it's a, it's a skill set by itself. And we always push it downwards because we always want to please. We're eager to deliver. Um, we respect timelines. Um, there is, you know, 10 o'clock means 10 o'clock doesn't actually 10 to 5 is the time you need to arrive. Um, so um, it, it's so you always earlier is, is yes, obviously yes. Is, is, is obviously means means more accurate. So it's we're always hard on ourselves. We're always harsh on ourselves to achieve, you know, 
perfectionism to deliver up to that standard over and over and over. And that takes a toll. So how do you balance that while still delivering uh, in this very competitive space? You know, I always think about this. And, and really, you know, what you know, f from a few exercises that we've gone through, um, whether it's the recent uh, Food Made Good exercise, which is the standard that we subscribe to uh, that talks about sustainability within the restaurant uh, space. And there are three pillars, your uh, sourcing, your environmental impact, and your community work, which is the human element. And it really starts from the basics, whether everyone has a contract or not, because, you know, we're, we're very lucky in this country because most of the world, people are hired on temp basis. People are paid in cash on a weekly basis. We have rules and uh, laws that protect us here. So it's, it's great to have that. What do you, what do you do above and beyond mm. to uh, maintain human hours? Uh, we work late. How do you balance that with arriving the next day? How do you balance that with taking time off? How do you encourage time off? Because for a lot of people in our industry, we don't like to take time off. And, and, and you know, especially certain junior staff, to them, time off means spending money. That means they're not in the restaurant having the staff meal. That means that they're spending money. They would rather work and not take time off. So it's up to us to show and present the value of taking care of one's own health and one's own mental being. I think that the, really the onus is on us and the responsibility is on us. I think beyond that is to value people's decisions to enter this as a career move, not just a side hustle or something they're doing on the side uh, in order to, to get by. And I think that only comes with certain career progression and career mapping that I try to do. We can't offer management positions or headshot to everyone, but there are certain roles and responsibilities that can be given to, to, to a lot of us, in, no matter what um, department you're working on, what, what space you're working in within a restaurant. So I think valuing that extra piece of work, whether it's doing you know, research for the next new menu or presenting certain dishes to the chef to, to, to test and, and offering certain competition or in front of the house, offering a lot of certifications in, from, from a beverage side or certain trainings or certain interests, having champions in the restaurant that will feed into, for example, the sustainability framework that we have. I don't necessarily work daily with all the produce or all the equipment or all the tools or even sometimes see the type of waste that goes out of the restaurant. So some of the better ideas have come from the frontline staff. So valuing that input and bringing them as part of the process, I think, goes a long way. <clears throat> and then obviously there are a lot of creative, incredible things that, you know, restaurant operators and hotels are doing with staff to encourage, obviously, um, one to take care of themselves, you know, mentally, physically, but also, you know, something that we're very proud of is our tie up with uh, the MAD Academy in, in Copenhagen. So it's something that I was a uh, part of when it was uh, a symposium that was done annually. And, and that was a life changing exercise for me. Uh, they've gone since then to create a, a scholarship um, that is available for anyone in the world from any industry in, 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 the food, in the food sector, whether you're a farmer, a baker, a chef, or a sommelier. And you can apply for that and you can attend that course. And it's quite impactful. Um, so we offered to pay for uh, the travel and accommodation for whoever scores that, scores that scholarship. So we, we've had now three alumni from, from Boca attend oh my God, uh, these, these sessions. And, and these are incredible. And I tell you, when people come back, they're changed, they're transformed because it takes a bit of that perspective change. And that can be applied to anything. You know, in our case, it's sustainability. And the moment that we do these um, sustainability or, or, or climate change literacy courses that everyone has to go through, either through me or with an external uh, a trainer, to understand why we're doing what we're doing, 
Um, what is important for us to, to know in the food systems? How do we fit into all of this? You can see things click. You can see things you know, change. And everyone has something to contribute because everyone's upbringing has definitely had an element of conservation. Whether they were asked to finish their plate or whether they were tending to a farm back in their own their houses or their relationship to the land, to food, to, to earth. So the other thing I wanted to ask you is, from your opinion, if what would be the sort of your top three basic tips that restaurants or kitchens can do to help towards sustainability goals? I, I get a lot of questions asking me, oh, do you compost or uh, where did you, where can we source locally? You know, what about these tomatoes? What about these leaves? I say, that's all, that's all fine. Yeah. But I think it takes one's own restaurant or own concept or own self to understand where you fit into this game. Right. Every journey is different. So the one thing that I encourage everyone to do is to do a bit of education. Education one, educate yourself and your, your senior teams on the purpose. How, what is going on in the world? how we fit into the food system, what's the problem with the food system, and what are you going to bring to the table? What is your purpose? What is your main aim? And you can narrate it in any way you want, as short or as long as you want it to be, saying we're in, in our case, it was we're a homegrown concept, and we want to dedicate parts of our menu to local ingredients. That's really how it started. So that's, that's number one, is to educate and to pledge something. Maybe you're focused on waste, that, that you want to actually tackle that. So that will be your calling. That's you, that will be your purpose. Maybe you really want to um, champion more plant and more vegetables on your menu. So it could be anything to you. I think the third part, which is so critical, is to measure and understand if waste is going to be your thing, measure your waste. Understand what are you throwing today? And it doesn't have to be a high-tech, ongoing exercise that you invest in equipment or, or any specific modules or consultants. You could do it yourself. You could do it by actually going through your garbage at the end of the day, assigning someone to take apart every single element in no matter how small or uh, how large you want these in, you want these uh, different categories to be. In our case, it's seven. Um, and on a scale that exists in every restaurant, measure and write it down. And you can do it for a week, for 10 days, for two weeks, tops. And then maybe model that against your business, those two weeks. And you've been running for quite some time. You can then model it against the whole year. Right. And there you go. You've got a fair understanding of what are the top categories of waste by weight. And you can start making changes from the low-hanging fruit. You know, if it's glass, what are you using? Using imported bottled water? Maybe you want to shift to a filtered water. You have to do it anyways in, in, in all cases. You know, at least from there, you have a baseline. You know, I always say if you want to, if you want to lose weight, you're going to measure your weight today. You're going you're gonna to go on the scale and you're going to understand this is my baseline and this is where I want to be in three months, six months, and you work towards that. And it's very similar, whether it's waste, whether it's resources, you look at your menu, you know, um, you, what are you purchasing in a month from your invoices? Even if you don't have a high-end system where you have, you, you've, you can look up every single ingredient by weight uh, and where you bought it from. Look at the top five ingredients that you're buying in the kitchen whether it's flour or meat or a certain vegetable, and say, for these top five ingredients, I want to move them to a slightly better environmental practice. Or I want to move them, I want to move at least one of them to source locally. Or I want to move them to become not just conventional but organic farming. Small steps that are accessible to you, that, mean, that make sense for your type of business and your type of resources. Those are amazing tips, though, because it, it is that simple. As you said, you know, it doesn't need to be rocket science. It's just measurable data. That's it. So then from the industry perspective, 
What are your predictions for the industry within five, 10 years? What would you like to see more of? I'm really enjoying um, seeing a lot more homegrown concepts. I'm enjoying seeing concepts that are representing cuisine that is very critical to this part of the world, whether it's UAE culture, whether it's the, the, the larger region, the larger Gulf region. Um, I, I would love to see this narrative take a stronger shape on what makes truly an, a restaurant from Dubai, from the UAE. What, is that, what does that mean? Someone to dig deeper into ingredients that grow here. I, I would love to, to do that. To, 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 you see, what, what we lack, I think, all of us in the industry is an understanding of what really grows in the UAE and the, in the closer countries throughout the year. And what are some ingredients that have some higher value that could be worthwhile exploring in a, in a high culinary gastronomic field? Is there someone that is raising a certain species of camels that's, that's he's feed or he, she's feeding them exceptional produce, taking care of them? They're very sensitive animals. Are we slaughtering them? In, in a way where it doesn't stress out the meat and getting some exceptional produce? Is there something that exists that's producing some exceptional milk? What about date heart and date palm and date pollen? That's something that is of a delicacy here in local... Co are, we, are we experimenting with that? Is there a, a traceable source of a particular fish that is thriving that we can elevate it in a, in a certain way? I think more and more with you know all the exceptional chefs that are doing incredible work here representing um cuisines from from the region i think we're now starting to see these stories and i would love to see restaurants that are perfecting that narrative um i think you know gimmicks will slowly trickle down you know cheese falling from the ceiling on top of your burger and liquid nitrogen and all that stuff, I think we'll maybe shy away. Still, there is an entertainment element that is that will still remain. And I think Dubai generally sells that. And we will still need operators that will do that, but do that really well. Mm. But I would, you know, I'm 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 waiting to see a lot of these creative chefs that are right now still maybe in their own um you know, smaller spaces or working under someone or in a supper club, what they will do once they're given that platform to create on their own. The, the constant, um, since I've started doing this show, the constant thread that comes up with not just chefs, but so many different people is when are we going to have a modern gastronomic sort of Levantine restaurant because you have the Spanish, they have the modern, they have the French, they have the modern, even the British, they have the modern. When are we, and you're quite right, we've got a huge pool of talent here. When are we really going to see those or this cuisine being elevated so you have a crazy hummus dish or falafel or muta? There's so much because the region is so rich right and it's going to happen i believe it really the chefs are here the the talent is here but i tell you what's missing what's missing and what a lot of these countries that you've mentioned have is this connection to artisans mm. to artisanal producers to people who are tending the land or the sea or certain produce and they're doing exceptional work there and there's a connection with our industry right now there's a big disconnect we know generally we have a certain idea but we don't know who exactly because there's no for for a long time there's not been a lot of value in doing that anyways so whoever's producing you know organic food here or 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 fishing certain there's not a lot of they don't see that value how am i going to compete with some of the best oysters coming from Japan and France on, or 
um, you know, certain meat or vegetables. Yeah. But the moment we value that more, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a circular thing, right? So we have to give more attention. And then they will raise that profile. And then we say, okay, we need more of this. I love this quote from Yazan al-Qudmani, who's the, um, the, the main, the chief farmer or the owner of the largest organic farm in the UAE. He says that we do not eat what farmers grow. Farmers grow what we eat. So the moment that we start giving more value or giving a lot more, you know, letting ourselves be a lot freer in receiving what they're producing yes. because they know, they know yes. the land. Yes. Then they will say, okay, then we're going to have that, that bigger connection. But they the need to dictate up. to us. Yes. That's all it is. Yeah. You know. So now we've come to the quick fire questions. First things first, are you a sweet or a salty? Salty. Sumac or zatar? Sumac. This is a special one for you, the next one. Oysters or salicornia? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Both uh, go incredibly well, right? Yeah. Oh God, oysters. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> what are your, at the moment right now, what are your top three cuisines that you love to eat? Um, a lot of things firing in through my head. Uh, at the moment, I'm going through a phase of exploring lentils from different cuisines. You know, what are people doing with lentils? Ah, There's a lot coming from, uh, obviously, Asian cuisine, Indian cuisine. You know, it's big here in the Middle East. Wow. Whether it's in a curry yeah. or in a soup or in a... That's a good one. That's the first time it. we've had that. <laughs> Any any others? Um, I love Thai cuisine. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's a favorite of mine. Of course, Spanish. I of enjoy course, a lot. Of course. Who would you say are your top three culinary heroes? And they don't need to be chefs. Mm. Nice one. Okay. Um, first one, uh, Douglas McMaster. He is the chef behind Silo in London. This is the truly zero waste restaurant. And I, and I love his work because of his approach, um, his creative way uh, to think of everything that comes into the kitchen and questioning what we do with it, whether it's the peels or the chops or the ends or whatever is even left over after using these to make a broth. What do we do? With that last bit, let's use fermentation to transform it. It is the one restaurant that at the end of the service, the entire waste fits into one small basket. Oh my God. They've even questioned the way that uh, certain problematic ingredients like sugar are transported, are used. So they commissioned uh, a sailboat to bring in sugar from somewhere in the Caribbean the way that it was done in the early days and waited for that long and said, you know what, for the entire year, our use, use of sugar is going to be only from that source. Wow. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Crazy, right? So, but you need people like that yeah. to imagine what wow. is possible so that we can think of ways that we can adapt that. Number two? Number two, um, I would say Chef... Uh, Chantal from Apricity, again, in, in, in London, in the UK. And um, they're doing a really beautiful cuisine, uh, executed uh, fantastically, but also in this relaxed vibe. I love all the communication that's coming from them, championing, obviously, women in the kitchen, women-led restaurant in general and owned and operated, uh, but also uh, punching really, really high. I think they've received the Green Star recently. So uh, I, I enjoy everything that is coming from them, and I and I, you know, aspire that we would um, we look up to these people. And your last one, um, just on top of my head, obviously the incredible chefs behind uh, Distrutar, because they're coming obviously with that long line of culinary heritage from El Bui, and uh, I had the privilege of uh, visiting the El Bui Foundation, the museum, this last summer. And one thing that, you know, everyone who's dined or, or understands a little bit about 
you know, that restaurant and its heritage is them documenting and saving every scrap of paper where they've just jotted down one idea or one thought or one ingredient. And they, they were able to save all of that. Oh my God. And that's gold. Yeah. That's gold. And, and, and I, and I, you know, we, we try to do the same in the restaurant and save a lot of things uh, and, and just document and realize and be aware of that creative process. Because you start with one thing, you start with an idea. And usually the idea is, is why not? Why can't we? How can we deliver it differently? How can we think of it differently? How can we talk about it differently? Um, and then going through the process of understanding, okay, what's possible, what's not, given what we can get here, what we can't, seasonality, uh, timeline, uh, prices, whether we can sell it or not. I enjoy that. I, I, I love that. From your experience throughout the years, what would you say has been your funniest ever restaurant or kitchen incident <laughs> that you've either been involved in or that you've seen? Uh, quickly, at the top of my head, um, I think it was the first three months of opening in the restaurant and we had a wave of, of, of guests and people would come in you know, week in, week out, we had this gentleman who would dine alone. Um, and he would, uh, he would order, you know, certain, certain list of items on the menu. And we had one particular person looking after him. She's no longer with us, unfortunately, in the restaurant. I mean, she's, I think she's, she's back home. Um, and she would always take care of him. And, and, you know, he was lovely, he was pleasant. And at one point after perhaps on his sixth or seventh visit, she asked him, what else can I do for you? How else can I you know, just be grateful and, you know, just tell you how appreciative we are of you coming in and, and dining with us? It's like, you know what? Everything's perfect. One thing you could do for me, though, is maybe you can feed me that last bit of, piece of fish. So she hesitated for a second, but then she's like, you know, you know and then she just took it and then fed him. Oh my god! <laughs> and we all saw that in oh. in slow mo. It was a little bit awkward, <laughs> and then she just excused herself and left. And that was it. And he asked for the bill, and he left. Oh my god! <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs> Customers are weird, aren't they? Odd one. You know, they're weird. <laughs> uh, Omar, what advice would you give? to a 16 year old Omar Shihab oh my god um, I think put myself out there a lot more make more mistakes I was always hesitant to try immediately without thinking about the problem at hand or the activity that I'm about to do I was it was very important for me to do my homework right and study really hard before that presentation or before making a decision or before saying anything in a meeting or um, sending that email. I think I would have loved myself to fail faster. Love that. So... Omar, for anyone who wishes to reach out to you and get hold of you and learn more, where can they do that? Oh, you can um, follow me on LinkedIn. I'm Omar Shihab on LinkedIn, on Instagram as well. Um, and if you want to send me an email, I'm omar at boca.ae. So O-M-A-R at B-O-C-A dot A-E. I just wanted to recap a few of the things that we've discussed because it's been quite a phenomenal and detailed right. conversation. So from your childhood food memory growing up in the marshes, that sounds amazing. Those clams to the education growing up, mm. American University of Sharjah, big shout mm -hmm. out to them. Uh, obviously working through the consultancy, economy, all of that sort of thing that would have set you up for later on in life. Then the inception of Boca, how it was born, the challenges, the pre-openings, the team getting everything ready, you taking on so many things at the same time and learning so much. Then, of course, 
the phenomenal success you've had throughout the years with so many people in the team, Michelin, 50 best, go Milo. Of course, the, 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 the women leaders that you have, and now you have a phenomenal chef, Patricia. Big shout out to her. And of course, the sustainability part, which, which I believe everyone who has either been in touch with you or has not been in touch with you has learned through your phenomenal work then the the human part which i think is fantastic and then the quick fire so omar on behalf of the chef jkp podcast i just want to say please keep you know doing the incredible work you're doing with sustainability inspiring all of us to do better and really it has been an amazing conversation i've learned a huge deal and i just wanted to say personally thank you very much for taking the time to be here and really discussing so many things thank you so much Thanks, James. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>